Uh, good morning, everybody. We we'll now start the scientific program for the second day, and the first speaker of the day is Dr. Johan Christopher. Dr. Johan Christopher is known to all of us. He is currently director of cardiac imaging at the KR Hospital Hyderabad. He is also CSI imaging subspecialty chairperson, joint chairperson Asian Society of CV Imaging. He has fellowship in cardiac imaging, Harvard Medical School, Boston, 2007, DNB cardiology coordinator at the care hospital, PI of the PGDCC care hospital, publication in several national and international journal, and he is invited faculty for conferences all over the world. I request Dr. Ashish Malhotra and Hirend Kumar to initiate the session. Morning, everybody. And uh, today we have got Johan, Dr. Johan Christopher for a very important session. As we all know, coronary calcium is now uh, coming a long way. And we know that it is very useful in predicting that atherosclerosis has started in the artery. But what are the pitfalls? Because many times there is a high calcium score, but no obstructive lesions. And many times there is a low calcium score and a severely obstructive lesion. So how to use it in our clinical practice Dr. Johan will enlighten us. Dr. Johan, please. Uh, morning, respected chairpersons and uh, my senior uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, today, I'll be talking to you about coronary calcium scoring, its nuances. So we've all had the uh, uh, pleasure of looking at prognosis through various methods in the last 100 years. And the first among all was whether uh, one or two or three vessels were involved angiographically, whether the LAD was involved or not, and whether the patient clinically had heart failure and therefore would have a poor prognosis or would have a high blood pressure and would therefore have a poor prognosis. So we have come a long way from there and we have the clinical score which we use commonly, the Framingham risk score. And by the input of very simple clinical inputs, we do get a number and based on this number, we are able to prognosticate and also treat the patients. It was uh, in 2009 that Dr. Philip Greenland and the Northwestern University came up with this algorithm of calcium scoring that could be fitted into the conventional clinical scoring. And you can see in this 64-year-old uh, patient who had only a 4.7% risk based on his clinical profile, moved into an intermediate category once we input his calcium score of 175. So it has the potential of moving a patient from uh, different categories, low to high, high to low, and low to intermediate. And therefore, fine tunes the way that we look at patients and their prognosis and their treatment protocols. So calcium scoring basically is atherosclerosis and is exclusively in atherosclerotic arteries. It does not happen in any other disease. It is obviously more frequent in advanced lesions and in older age. However, the calcium score, the percentage of stenosis and vulnerable plaque is non-linear. And this is something that we need to understand. We started off with the EBCTs, which were stationary scanners, and now we have moved to the multi-slice CT scanners with a very high temporal resolution and very good spatial resolution. What is important is we have moved from uh, a very high radiation to a radiation of about half a millisievert in scanners if the body weight is ideal and about one millisievert if the person is obese. So radiation no longer seems to be a major problem in subjecting these patients to a calcium score. The way we do it is by placing a patient in the CT scan with ECG leads and we do what is called a gated spiral scan, does not revolve any other preparation apart from putting the ECG leaves. No fasting, no creat, nothing. It happens in about six seconds, and you have the report in about five minutes. Now, there are multiple calcium scoring methods, the Agatston, the volume, and the density score, but we stick to the Agatston score because of its widespread availability and easy inter-individual read. Now, when you get a calcium score, this is what it is. You have a score on the left, and then you tell us whether there is a plaque or not. The risk of heart is calculated, and the risk of an MI obviously is known. So we have 
uh, five data sets of 0, 1 to 10, 11 to 100, 101 to 400, and more than 400. At the 101 to 400, this is a point wherein generally, as cardiologists, we refer these patients for a uh, functional testing, either a nuclear scan or a dobutamine or an MR scan. Anything above 400 means there is a 50% chance of having a more than 50% block, and therefore, if the patient is symptomatic, then he would go straight to the cath lab. Now, this is a 55-year-old gentleman. He's a non-diabetic, non-hypertensive, non-smoker, some family history of heart disease. We did his calcium score, and this was the report. It was zero. We looked at the coronaries thereafter on CT, and this is where we inject contrast. And except for a myocardial bridge that you can see, the coronaries are squeaky clean. This is a lady who's 65 years, diabetic, hypertensive, with tobacco use, and she had a calcium score of 1,609. And then when we did the CT, we found multiple focal calcified lesions in all the three vessels. This brings me back to another question which is commonly asked as, what is the number of calcium beyond which uh, we need to stop? Well, it is very, very dependent on the operator, his expertise, and the quality of the CT scanner that you have. Now, what we are doing at Hyderabad is that even at 1500, we are able to scan and give a reasonable uh, report uh, to the clinician. However, the caveat is that if we have calcium in the surgical area, that is the left main, osteal LAD, osteal LCX, and the osteal RCA, then we would possibly differ after doing the calcium to the patient to have either an angiogram or he has a functional testing. So more than the calcium number, the location and the intensity of calcium uh, seems to be the way where we would possibly refer it for another diagnosis. However, this is again dependent on the patient's profile and the relationship the imager has with the referring clinician. So as of today, there is no number for which we stop. It's totally dependent on the operator's experience. Now, who do we suggest a calcium score? It is reasonable for somebody with an intermediate risk score of 10 to 20% FRS and may be reasonable to somebody in the 6 to 10%. However, it's not indicated for a low risk patient. So in this algorithm of asymptomatic patients with a 10-year risk of MI or death less than 10%, we would not do a calcium score. If it is high, more than 20% risk, again, they would not have a calcium score. It is the intermediate population of 10 to 20% where we would perform a calcium score. If it's less than 100, he would have primary prevention. Uh, statin would definitely be added and the LDL would be um, tuned down to less than 100. Anything more than 400, and this is, the, uh, uh, this is from the Nuclear Medicine Societies, they would be referred for a functional testing, preferably a PET or SPECT, and uh, various other labs have kept it as 800. But anything between 400 and, uh, 100 and 400, they would be subject to secondary prevention, which would include an addition of aspirin and statin. Now, the 2007 uh, American College guidelines came up with it. The 2013 American College gave the guidelines, and finally, uh, it is the recommendation that even after the use of traditional risk factors, if you're not able to accurately place a patient, uh, either the family history, the HSCRP, or the calcium score, or the ABI can be used, and it has got us a 2B indication. Uh, it's not a 2A indication, but it's a 2B indication, and that seems reasonable because of the uh, uh, paucity of data that is still there. Calcium scoring is obviously better in assessing cardiovascular disease compared to CIMT, which is better for patients with cerebrovascular disease. Calcium scoring is extremely sensitive for the presence of stenosis, but it's only moderately specific. And, as the, and the absence of calcium, again, is very, very predictive of the absence of significant coronary artery disease. Now, there are limitations in the technique. Very large patients, anybody less than 50 years, uh, who cannot have uh, a proper breath hold. There is insurance problems in covering calcium scoring and a very high irregular heart rate, again, can cause a problem. 
And once the calcium score is done, if it is not combined with the risk profiling, clinical risk profiling, then it does not become really useful. Now, there is a contraindication, obviously, and, the, and those are pregnant women, patients with a prior myocardial infarction, prior angioplasty, and prior bypass surgery have no benefit by undergoing a calcium scoring. And obviously, uh, anybody with a heart rate of more than about 95 or 100, then it becomes difficult if you don't have somebody to do beta blockade. Anybody with cardiac implants, multiple wires, pacemaker, etc., again becomes an issue. Now, the accuracy trial which was done clearly showed that the sensitivity is extremely high for somebody with a zero score and the specificity, however, is much lower. When you look at ethnicity, uh, certain populations like the white have a higher predictive value with the calcium score compared to the black, but whatever it is, calcium score at any ethnicity, at any sex can determine and uh, help us prognosticate patients with cardiovascular disease. In asymptomatic patients, you can see there's a quartile range of calcium scoring with regard to the relative risk of an MI. Compared to 100 versus more than 1,000, you can see there is a huge step up in the relative risk. In the same realm of Framingham risk score of 20 to 20%, we can divide patients into three tertiles depending on the calcium score of less than 100 compared to a casual score of more than 400. And the NHGM a couple of years ago again showed us that if you have a calcium score of more than 300, and this is the number that we are using right now, the risk of coronary events are extremely high compared to if you had a score of zero. Similarly here is that if you have a score of more than 377 in another uh, study, the risk of coronary artery disease and lesions are extremely high. Now, whether statins can actually reverse this or can change the prognosis, we do not know. There is no clear evidence as of now if we use only a calcium score for the uh, risk profiling of a patient. In terms of prognosis, a zero score in an asymptomatic patient has a very, very high protective value. The protection does not last if the patient is clearly symptomatic. And obviously, if the patient has a calcium score of more than zero, you will see that there is a high risk for cardiovascular disease. Now, again, just to show you that in a patient with an FRS less than 10, there is a high predominance of calcium less than 400, while the predominance of calcium more than 400 is very high if the FRS goes to more than 10. In the same FRS score, you can see that with a low FRS patient, you are able to divide these patients into three groups uh, depending on the calcium score. So it helps in fine tuning patients within the same score. In the emergency room, things are a little different and the calcium score does not seem to afford a protection. Even if you have a calcium score of zero, there is a high incidence of cardiovascular events simply because these patients have a high incidence of non-calcified plaques. In another study, when you're trying to look for cardiovascular disease, if you have a calcium score in addition to assessment of peripheral vascular disease and a diabetic nephropathy, the chance of you missing a significant lesion is very, very low. Dr. Christopher, please summarize. Warranty. Yes, sir. When we look at a warranty of a calcium score of zero, you can clearly see if you're non-diabetic, you have almost a 15-year free interval of cardiovascular disease. However, diabetics have a less than five-year incidence of heart disease. So that means the warranty is only about five years. There is no role for repeat calcium score testing because of the radiation involved and because statin use itself increases calcium score. However, the presence of calcium helps in the compliance of patients, and more importantly, in the Eisner study, clearly showed that the downstream testing is much less if you use a calcium score, and you actually get a better, a lower heart disease risk without increasing downstream costs and downstream testing. And uh, the present technology here is to use AI in calcium scores that even if you don't have a gated scan that many small centers would not have, you could still get a very good calcium score using AI. And this is some work done from our American partners. I will end my uh, talk by saying, uh, by talking about Dr. Daniel Berman's uh, recommendation that the recommendation by major professional organizations in cardiology that coronary calcium score be at measured is likely to have as great an impact on saving lives as the recommendation that cholesterol be measured and controlled. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Uh, Dr. Christopher, a de novo lesion having a calcium is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular events. 
following statins increase in calcium score is associated or believed to have a protective effect what is the reason for the paradox yes sir so uh, what does happen is that when you add a statin it actually creates a kind of cementing over the existing plaque usually a vulnerable plaque so once that happens because of the various uh, metalloproteinases there is calcium deposition on the lesion so actually the presence of calcium in that setting gives a protective value so that's the reason once you have a statin naive patient you do a calcium score then when you start him on statins the next calcium score is not going to be reliable simply because statins itself in a way promote uh, promote the uh, calcium any other comments from the chair persons otherwise we move on to the next session uh, dr christopher um this ca calcium score has been um, uh, used as a promotional gimmicks by the various hospitals and they say if the calcium score is zero you can have a mi free period of 15 years you will not have i will give you warranty of 15 years that you will not have an mi how correct is it sir a uh, calcium the banners written as 15 years warranty period get your calcium score done if it is zero i'll we have a warranty of 15 years that you will not get an mi Yes, sir. So obviously, sir, the calcium score cannot be used in isolation. It has to be used by a clinician with the traditional risk factor profiling. The calcium score of zero in a completely asymptomatic patient does give a warranty, and the data, as I just showed you, in a non-diabetic is around fifteen years, provided it is integrated with the risk factor profiling of the patient in an intermediate patient. So these are all the caveats that have to be used. in a diabetic patient this does not hold good the warranty is less than 4 years provided you have not used it in a high risk patient you have used it only in an intermediate risk patient so i think it is very important that the calcium score is used alongside a traditional calculator mm -hmm. either the mesa calculator or the frs or any mm -hmm. one of the clinical calculator that we use okay, and then you. only a risk profiling done ha, not used in isolation that's the message Okay. All right. Good uh, we morning. We finish this session and we now move on. I just had one one query. Good morning, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now that uh, Dr. Christopher, now that uh, statins are being used just mm -hmm. like an over-the-counter formulation, like uh, even people who don't go to doctors, who don't uh, go to physicians, and they get their lipids checked themselves, and they take statins uh, without uh, you know getting advices from physicians. So in that case, how would you like you know counter this when you yourself saying that statins are going to make uh, calcium scores unreliable? So how how is it you know make it going to make a difference? Yes, sir. so uh, it's very important that at least the first scan done in a statin naive patient. uh and that will give us the true yes, 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 of the atherosclerosis burden however if you are able to integrate the statin use and the traditional risk and the calcium score i think a reasonable estimate can be found by the treating clinician it's not perfect as you said because many people are on statin many patients with a zero or 10 score coming up with a score of 400 by the next year and when we look at this prescription there's a whole lot of statins and doses that are being used so i think all this has to be looked into before you give the final sort of warranty so to speak with right. this we conclude this session we pass on to the next session and our next speaker is dr a george koshi he's a senior consultant cardiologist at the cosmopolitan hospital trivandrum honorary cardiologist to the governor of kerala former professor and head of cardiology at the government medical college trivandrum former director of kerala heart foundation and former president of the kerala chapter csi iccia and interventional council of kerala and has several publications i request the chairpersons dr boyni gopal and suresh kaur to chair this session thank you thank you dr kanoria i think uh, when we come to the uh, debate between the oral anticoagulants and the newer oral anticoagulants the last bastion as we say has been the uh, mechanical prosthetic valves and the mitral stenosis even they have removed the mitral regurgitation from this group so let us see what is happening in this particular field in valvular af the so called valvular af the role of uh, direct orally acting direct acting oral anticoagulants i would invite dr george koshi to present this paper over to george koshi who is an excellent speaker and let us listen to what he has to say dr george koshi please
जॉर्ज कोशी Good morning, sir. I would like to first thank Dr. P. C. Manoria for this kind invitation. I will be speaking on DOAX in valvular atrial fibrillation, and what exactly is the emerging data? Can you discuss DOAX in valvular heart disease? There are five scenarios. Number one, mitral regurgitation, which is really a non-valvular AF. Number two, aortic valve disease, which again is a non-valvular AF. The third will be a bioprosthetic mitral valve. Beyond three months, normally functioning, it is almost like a normal valve, so that it is also generally considered as a non-valvular AF. So finally, we are left with two entities: moderate to severe mitral stenosis and mechanical heart valve. And along with that, a bioprosthetic mitral valve in the initial three months. So these are the three conditions which are included in the category of valvular atrial fibrillation. And DOAX are ordinarily not recommended in these three situations, as per the conventional guideline. Number one, mechanical prosthetic valve. Number two, moderate to severe mitral stenosis. And number three. Mitral bioprosthetic valve in the initial three months, and that is what exactly the guideline tells the ESC guideline as well as the ACC AHA guideline. What I am going to discuss is the current data of DOAC in these three situations. This is a parasternal short, long-axis view of a patient with rheumatic mitral stenosis. Look at these cases, the spontaneous echo contrast. And more chance for thrombus formation in mitral stenosis. In comparison to MR, the thrombus tends to be larger. There is stasis of blood in the LA in MS. There is no stasis in mitral regurgitation. The mitral valve opens well in diastole, and the LA is washed clean in systole. The LA thrombus is confined to the left atrial appendage in more than 90% cases of MR. But it can be beyond the left atrial appendage in more than 50% cases of mitral stenosis. So MS is different from MR. We should clearly understand that the spontaneous echo contrast you get only in MS. You never get in MR. And moreover, greater fibrosis and damage to the left atrial wall in MS compared to MR. This is important with a non-rheumatic etiology. With rheumatic etiology, it may not be correct. And if you look at the recurrence of embolic events, very high in MS, 15 to 40 per 100 patient years. And another important point: thrombus formation occurs in both mechanical heart valve and rheumatic MS, but but the mechanism is different. In mechanical heart valve, it is the artificial surface that matters. Mechanical heart valve has more thrombogenicity. There is no stasis if the patient is in sinus or not. It is the artificial surface, and that is why multiple factors may be involved in the thrombogenesis. And vitamin K antagonists act at different sites. We know it acts at at least seven to eight sites. Work for it, and it is more effective. And what do the INR recommended with vitamin K antagonists in a mechanical heart valve? At least three. Whereas rheumatic is what is the mechanism? It is not the artificial surface. It is actually stasis. Stasis. So the native valve and mechanism is stasis. And look at the INR. The INR recommended is only two to three. It is not three. So probably in rheumatic MS, the Novak may be effective, unlike what we observed in a mechanical heart valve. And if you look at the type and type with vitamin K antagonist, we know it is very disappointing. This is the data. Japi, the Indian. More than 3,000 patients, people with the INR below two was actually more than 75 percent, indicating that most of the people do not have proper anticoagulation with vitamin K antagonists. And if you take those in the therapeutic range, it is only around 20 percent. Now, what is the outcome of DOAC in patients with mitral stenosis? Interesting article came in 2019. South Korean article, seven thousand three hundred and fifty-seven patients, 
native valve mitostenosis with anticoagulation, not a randomized trial. It is not possible. So it is basically propensity score matching. Reasonably good. You had 1,917 people on DOAC, 5,440 patients on warfarin. Propensity score matching. What did they find? Systemic stroke and systemic embolism. Significantly less with DOAC compared to warfarin. Intracranial hemorrhage, significantly less with DOAC compared to warfarin. And all-cause mortality, very, very strong point. Hardened point. Look at the p-value, significantly favoring the DOAC. And look at the event rate, ischemic stroke or systemic embolism, 2.22% per year with the DOAC, 4.19% with warfarin. And intracranial hemorrhage is well known, the main advantage of DOAC over vitamin K antagonist is 50% reduction in intracranial bleed, which was observed in all the trials uniformly. And look at the event rate, 0.49 with the DOAC and 0.93 with warfarin, so just the half. So what was observed in the other trial was observed here also. Now, this is another analysis, meta-analysis of six trials from South Korea again. They looked at all valvular heart disease. This is not only mitostenosis, but it gives some idea about what is really happening. They looked at the ischemic stroke, less with the NOAC, intracranial hemorrhage, less with the NOAC, all-cause mortality, less with the NOAC, hospitalization for GI bleeding, less with the NOAC. In fact, some of the earlier trials, it was a matter of concern. The GI bleeding can be slightly higher, especially with dabigatran with the NOAC, but that was not observed here. Now, hospitalization for major bleeding, composite outcome, everything was favoring DOAC in comparison to warfarin. This is, again, another analysis which came in 2019, comparison of the new oral anticoagulants and warfarin in patients with atrial fibrillation and valvular heart disease, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Again, various studies, the number of patients, ultimately you find stroke and systemic embolism reduced by 22% with a significant confidence interval. Intracranial hemorrhage, that had been the consistent observation with all DOAC till date. And look at that value again, 49%. Again, all trials have shown 50% reduction in intracranial bleeding with the DOAC compared to vitamin K antagonist with a significant confidence interval, 0.33 to 0.79. So DOACs in patients with mitostenosis and atrial fibrillation, this is the editorial comment. This is time for a randomized clinical trial. And in fact, one or two small trials have already been initiated. And I think India should take the lead because we are having the maximum number of people with rheumatic mitostenosis. And something on the bioprosthetic valve. We know that beyond three months, bioprosthetic valve is almost like a native valve. But many of the trials have excluded people with bioprosthetic valve so that we don't have a very firm data. Some group analysis have shown some 30 percent, 30 patients or 32 patients in each group. So this is a large trial, the river trial, very recently published, 2020, river oxaban in patients with atrial fibrillation and bioprosthetic mitral valve. The inclusion criteria, more than 18 years of age with atrial front of atrial fibrillation, the point is bioprosthetic mitral valve receiving your planned use of oral anticoagulant for thromboembolism prophylaxis, actually more than 48 hours after mitral valve surgery. 18% of the patients were between 48 hours and three months. 18% of the patients. Altogether, 105 patients, 1,005 patients, 500 in each group. And this was the observation. When you look at the primary outcome, the mean time to death, major adverse cardiac events, major bleeding was favoring DOAC. The secondary outcome, cardiovascular mortality or thromboembolic event, 3.4% with the DOAC, whereas 5.1% with warfarin. Now, the most important thing, any stroke, 
Look at the value, 0.6% with the DOAC and 2.4% with WAFA. So you just concluded that in patients with Dr. AF, Puri, no, good morning. Mitral, program is running in time. Please join 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. With respect to the mean time until the primary outcome of death, major cardiovascular events or major bleeding at 12 months. Now, what about the mechanical heart valve? We know about the realigned trial. The use of dabigatran in patients with mechanical heart valve was associated with increased rate of thromboembolic and bleeding complication, both as compared with warfarin. That is why it is not recommended. So the first thromboembolic event, first bleeding event, both are favoring warfarin when it comes to a mechanical heart valve. And the trial was terminated early. But one point, most clinical outcome trials occurred in the group enrolled just after valve replacement, rather than those enrolled three months after surgery. So if you do a similar trial, mechanical heart valve, enrolling patients beyond three months or six months, maybe DOAC will be good. So that is, you know, the, still the door is open. Non-vitamin K antagonists, oral anticoagulants for mechanical heart valve. So this is the editorial comment. In our opinion, a single trial with a single NOAC does not represent sufficient evidence for missing a therapeutic strategy. So one NOAC, minute left, Doctor. Doctor Koshi, one minute left. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm concluding. Now, NOACs after TAVR, we have the Galileo trial. What about after TAVR? They compared aspirin with rivaroxaban versus DAPT, and they found that DAPT is better. So this is one situation where even now DOACs are not recommended. So I'm concluding my talk. DOACs effective and safe in MR and other valvular heart disease with AF. We already know that. Now DOACs are safe in mitral bioprosthetic valve with AF. We knew it is safe beyond three months. Now we know that it is probably safe beyond 48 hours based on the river trial. Mechanical heart valve, they do, do require vitamin K antagonists. They do require warfarin. And now newer data suggests that DOACs are more effective than vitamin K antagonists in mitral stenosis and DAF with significantly less bleed than to intracranial bleed. And finally, a randomized trial is required before DOACs are recommended as standard of care in moderate to severe mitral stenosis and atrial fibrillation. And I think such trials will be available and DOACs may take over the position of warfare in, in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Koshi. Dr. Kaul, for your comments. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Uh, Koshi, sir, it was a wonderful uh, insight into what all is happening. Uh, I just had a few uh, queries, uh, which, like the Korean trial that you showed, sir, uh, which was primarily, the trial was targeted on mitral stenosis patients. Did they have, you know, um, any subsets in severity, whether it was mild, moderate, or severe? No, such minor details are not available. In fact, it's not a randomized trial or anything like that. It is actually, you know, a, a propensity matching of uh, two groups of people. So in the propensity matching, they have taken a lot of variables. But, you know, what, however good it is done, such a trial cannot, you know, be equated with a randomized trial. Okay. So Thank the you. reason for uh, speak, you know, taking up this was that a lot of trials, uh, if you review the data, they have included mild mitral stenosis in non-valvular atrial fibrillation at uh, some, you know, uh, in some studies. So uh, can, uh, this is the area where you know we don't have consensus whether you need to include mild mitral stenosis, uh, especially. I'm not talking about rheumatic or non-rheumatic discussion. Mild mitral stenosis with as a part of. Uh, non-valvular atrial fibrillation. What is your take on it? No, I think when you look at the definition of valvular AF, they mention about moderate to severe mitral. We don't include mild mitral stenosis with a mean gradient of three or four. When you tell about moderate to severe, that means really there's a gradient of, mean gradient of at least more than six, and the mitral valve area has to be less than 1.5. So uh, there are people with mitral Kushi. Kushi. The point which I just wanted to raise was that all this data are from a single country, that is Korea. As far as India is concerned, your point is well valid that unless we have a randomized control trial, 
unless we have a data. The problem with us is that most of the patients with rheumatic mycosinosis happen to be in the lower socioeconomic status. And they are more likely to skip uh, DOVAC rather than vitamin K, especially if you look at the cost effect, the cost factor. So I think that uh, uh, we need more data from India before we say that in mitosinosis at least uh, the DOVACs can replace vitamin K antagonists. You have already emphasized that point, but I think it needs a more uh, emphasis. I think with this, we move on to the next session. And the next session is a very interesting debate. And the speakers for the next session are Dr. Mangesh Tivaskar and Dr. Vijay Panikar. Dr. Mangesh Tivaskar, all of us know, is a consultant physician and diabetologist, Chilpa Medical Research Center, Mumbai, Honorary Secretary, National API, ICP, PRF, own editor board of JAPI and several other journal, governing body best zone representative, ACP, guest editor, Insulite Journal, World Journal of Anemia, and has delivered over 1,000 lectures. Our next debater is Dr. Vijay Panikar, who is also a renowned diabetologist and honorary consultant at the Leelawati Hospital, ex-professor of medicine, Somaya Medical College, Mumbai, ex-vice president, RSSDDI, past chairman, RSSDDI, Maharashtra, organizing chairman, RSDDI, National Conference, Mumbai, 2021, 20 publications and several chapters, pioneer work in triple drug therapy and low-dose pyoglitazone 7.5, and has authored RSDDI guidelines in hospital management of diabetes. The time allotted to each speaker is 10 minutes and two minutes for rebuttal after both the speakers have spoken. Over to chairpersons, Dr. Sabu and Dr. Sos to conduct the session. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Manoria, sir, for giving me this opportunity. And this is really a very interesting debate, and I will not be taking much of the time for GLP-1 agonist uh, and uh, insulin. It is a debate between the two. What is the first choice of injectable, whether it is GLP-1 agonist or insulin? So for GLP-1 agonist, we will have Dr. Mangish Tivaskar, who will be presenting for it. And for uh, insulin, we have Dr. Vijay Panikar, sir, for it. So initially, we will start with the infectin or the GLP-1 agonist and Dr. Mangesh Tivaskar will be defending it. Over to you, sir. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you for those kind words of introduction. And I have to be very quick. And good morning, Panikar, sir. And wish you all a very happy and prosperous new year. And Dr. Manoria and the entire team, thank you very much for this opportunity. Now, the point of debate it's today is uh, incretins. They're the first choice of injectable therapy whenever it is required. So let's look at the realities of diabetes, which are really hard beaten realities. Okay, this is a national diabetes statistic report. And they say that at the time, you know, most of the people with diabetes, nearly almost 90% are either overweight or obese. More than 50% have uncontrolled diabetes. Around 70% have uncontrolled blood pressure. And 45% have dyslipidemia along with the presence of diabetes. And we know that cardiovascular risk and diabetes, they go hand in hand together. And there are so many factors which actually interact along with diabetes to give you these cardiovascular complications related to diabetes. So diabetes increases the risk of every possible vascular related outcome, no matter it could be a heart attack, a peripheral vascular disease, a retinopathy, a stroke, nephropathy, peripheral vascular disease, or neuropathy. And this is the pivotal slide, which is very important. Now, if you really look at the slide, the complications which are present at the time of diagnosis, look at nearly 40% people, they have either some kind of an established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or the high risk of developing an atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or they do have some kind of a renal involvement. And we also know that if there is a presence of renal involvement, the cardiovascular event and the all-cause mortality significantly goes high as the EGFR starts deteriorating from normal to towards the end stage renal disease. So why GLP-1, the receptor agonist here? Now, we have to understand that in a current scenario, we need to start looking beyond the just glycemic controls. And we need to also look at the cardiovascular, the renal, the weight management. And most importantly, we need to address that very important point, which is a current growing concept of time below the range, which addresses hypoglycemia. And this was what the Differenzo has published in 2009 at Chicago ADA. And uh, no, this was, uh, sorry, San Francisco ADA. And when he talked about omnius octet, and look at the place of GLP-1 receptor agonist in the uh, omnius octet of Difranzo causing diabetes. And you'll see that almost five or six areas are fairly well addressed by 
the use of GLP-1 receptor agonist. And they do have got a beautiful history. They are, you know, the research work is, you know, as long as insulin. Now we are approaching the centenary of insulin invention. So are also, we are approaching the uh, centenary of GLP-1 uh, invention and the research. Now, out of all these GLP uh, and the incredible-based therapies, now the, the drugs in the blue are the GLP-1 receptor agonists that are currently available. Now, there are a few which are available also in India, and they are, these are the different GLP-1 combinations uh, which we have available. Now, here, exenatide, lexicinatide, liraglutide are available in India. Even we do have a dulaglutide once in a day, which is available in India. And now, also a combination with the basal insulins are also available in India. There are few which are awaited to be getting approval in use of India. And why they are getting popularity globally is basically because apart from the glycemic benefits, they offer you huge amount of pleiotropic benefits. No matter it could be a cardiovascular protection, no matter it could be a weight reduction, no matter it could be a salvaging of the beta cell deterioration, it improves the beta cell proliferation, it reduces down the beta cell pro uh, apoptosis, it also causes suppression of the uh, glucose, uh, the alpha cell overactivity causing increase in the glucagon suppression. And also it has been demonstrated to have improvement in the insulin sensitivity at the adiposity level. But the most important point to understand is this, that these GLPs, they offer all these pleiotropic benefits in the pharmacological dosages or what we call it as a supraphysiological dosages. And that is the reason why dpp 4 which give you the physiological GLP-1 inhibition uh, agonism, probably do not have all those pleiotropic benefits in comparison to the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So what is the significance of this GLP-1 receptor agonist in the current diabetes management? And I don't have to go into the details about it. Most of you are aware about the various areas that it addresses. We have already discussed about it. As far as glycemic efficacy is concerned, you will see that whether it is a short-acting GLP-1 receptor agonist or the long-acting GLP-1 RA, as far as glycemic uh, efficacy and weight reduction is concerned, both offer almost beautifully well. But glycemic efficacy, probably the short-acting GLP-1 agonist address little better than the long-acting uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist. Now, you all know that the uh, basic diurnal variation of the blood glucose is one of the, uh, I would say, the indicators of the diabetes control. Now, here you will see that the moment the patient receives GLP-1 infusion, you can see that it technically becomes as normal as it has been depicted on this cartoon. Now, it also restores the beta cell function. Now, this is always a debate which is there, whether it addresses the beta cell function. Now, this is, look at, this is the normal one. This is what happens in diabetes. But the moment there is a GLP-1 receptor, and this is liraglutide, which has been infused continuously, look at the restoration of the beta cells. And that's exactly what, was shown in an in vitro petri dish trial where you know this beta cell mass was exposed to the GLP-1 and you can clearly see that it preserves the beta cell mass, it also improves the beta cell proliferation in vivo and it also reduces down the beta cell apoptosis as, as that is visible on this slide. Now one of the commonest pathognomic feature of uh, diabetes is the uh, you know, abut uh, abutting of the first phase response and where you can clearly see that the exenatide or a GLP-1 receptor infusion, you know, actually gives you back that, you know, improved first phase response of insulin, which is usually absent in most of the type 2 diabetic patients. Now, as far as the atherosclerotic vascular disease and GLP-1 receptor are concerned, any trial you pick up right from leader to rewind or pioneer, you will see that most of the trials will show you the benefits. But in this, leader sustain harmony outcomes and rewind outcomes had given us the signals of superiority as far as the cardiovascular outcome uh, advantages are concerned. The major adverse cardiac events also favor the use of GLP-1 agonists in comparison to the rest of the glucose lowering therapies. Now, this is the, these are the details. I'm not going to go into the details about this. This is leader. This is sustain where you can clearly see the captain there getting separated and it separates right, right from the eight to 10 weeks of the initiation. So very early benefits that you start getting. Rewind also similar way. And the beautiful thing that is that the GLP-1 receptor agonists have is something called as a plaque stabilization. Either it works by reducing the inflammation or it improves, it, it, it shifts actually 
the M, M, M1 environment to technically a vascular protective M2 environment. It reduces down the vascular smooth muscle proliferation. It also stabilizes the foam cells and reducing down the plaque rupture and it stabilizes the plaque. This is very important and has been proved in the leader as well as the rewind trial. Now, as far as the kidney protection is concerned, we all know that the subgroup analysis of leader has shown that liraglutide is better over the placebo therapy in either the reduction in the EGFR or the macroalbuminuria or the new appearance of a macroalbuminuria or the creatinine doubling time or the need for the renal replacement therapy. Similar was the data which was there for sustained CVOT. Similar was there in rewind CVOT renal subgroup analysis. So if you really put and summarize the GLP-1 receptor agonist benefits, if you really look at the lower three ones, liraglutide, dulaglutide, and semaglutide, you can see that the major cardiovascular events, they go down significantly. And also simultaneously, they offer the significant renal protection. Now quickly coming to the- Two minutes left, Dr. Basal, Dr. Yes, I'm, I'm going to finish within two minutes, sir. Okay. You can clearly see that if you really take the GLP-1 receptor agonist all together, it will definitely you know, suggest towards the benefits as far as the HB1C lowering towards the insulin. And same has been proved with semaglutide showing a most beautiful and a robust HB1C reduction. And that's the reason why in AWARD 7, it has been shown that in a CKD established patients, it reduces down and protects kidney very well. This is an ADA poster which was presented. And you can see that the individuals on 2AD are more likely to achieve the targets with GLP-1 in comparison with OADs and NADs. So what the guidelines say, finally, this was ADA 2020. You know, this is what exactly has, for the first time, people have started talking about whenever there is a patient who is high risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, CKD or heart failure, start using or start exploring the possibility of either SGLTs or GLP-1 receptor agonists. And the reason for this is basically all the advantages that we have. And this is what the 2021 guidelines, they say that if the injectable therapy is needed to reduce down HbA1c consider the use of GLP-1 receptor agonist in most of the patients prior to insulin. I think that was a very bold statement. So the concept of type 2 diabetes management, which was initially just a glycemia-based, focusing on HbA1c fasting and a prandial, now we have to look beyond glycemic control for lesser hypoglycemia, lesser weight gain or no weight gain or weight improvement, and the cardiovascular renal protection. I believe this glycemic composite is beautifully addressed with GLP-1. So to my choice, may be possibly that GLP-1 should be a first choice of the injectable when it comes to the choice of the therapy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tivaskar, sir, for beautifully defending the GLP-1 receptor agonist for their uh, glucose-lowering effect and the pleiotropic benefits. Now, let us uh, uh, invite Dr. Vijay Panikar, sir, for uh, defending diesel insulin. Sir, over to you. Open, Mangesh. Uh, can you see my slide, sir? Yes, sir. Please. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Very well spoken. Thank good you. data presented. But let us look at one minute. Realities. Yes. Insulin is more effective in lowering HbA1c than any other anti-diabetic drug. And no question about it. So that is one aspect. I won't go much into the detail. Now, intensification, if you see, compared to basal insulin, Mange showed some slides, but look at this. Over the quarter, the GLP-1 slowly loses its efficacy, but you look at the basal insulin, consistently good HbA1c reduction. So when is the first injectable really given in type 2 diabetes? Now the guidelines say you start from the beginning, but what is the ground reality? It starts with monotherapy, dual therapy, multiple therapy. And by the time you talk of injectable, it is 10 years down the line. And look at this. There is a clinical inertia. And this is ground reality. Guidelines say yes. This, but ground reality, by the time you talk of injectable, it's almost 10 years of therapy. And what has Yeb and his colleagues found? That initially, you do get a good HbA1c lowering with uh, GLP-1, but it fails to sustain. And the major effect is that the beta cells keep dying. The progression of the disease and C-peptide is a major predictor. So in other words, uh, A1C lowering effect of liraglutide was maintained for one year only. 
in patients with sufficient beta cell function, arguing for its use early in the natural. So that's why it should be given very early. It can't be given 10 years down the line. It's useless. Now, GLP should be given early. What's the benefit? Mangesh has nicely shown the benefits of giving it early. But insulin also has its benefits. These are studies which show that early insulin treatment prolongs beta cell function, promotes metabolic control, reduces glucotoxicity. But the ADA ESD has definitely put it right on top there in terms of its demonstrated cardiovascular and renal benefits. Now let us really look at the cardiovascular benefit. This is the leader trial. It shows a primary composite endpoint, 13% reduction, 13%, one, three. Look at the cardiovascular death, good, 22%. All cause mortality, 15%. But look at when you break it up, it's just numerical, non fatal MI, 12%. And it is not statistically significant. Non fatal stroke, 11%, not statistically significant. Heart failure hospitalization, 12%, not statistically significant. When you look at microvascular events, which are driven by glycemia, not statistically significant. Retinopathy, no, yes, in nephropathy, there is a benefit. But we have better drugs for that. You have an SGLT2 which gives you a much better response as far as renal is concerned. Now look at the other comparators which we have. UK PDS, metformin study. All-cause mortality reduced by 36%. Myocardial infarction reduced by 39%. Irish study, what was the Irish study? It was in non-diabetics with insulin resistance given pyoglitazone. And what did it show? Recurrent stroke reduced by 24%. Myocardial infarction reduced by 24%. New onset of diabetes by 52%. And a sub post hoc analysis of the Irish study where they looked at pre-diabetic patients and 2,885 over a 4.8 year period. And what did they find? Stroke reduced by 33%. Coronary syndrome, acute coronary syndrome by 52%. We are talking of 13% and 52%. We have drugs which can prevent all this. So we don't need this right in the beginning. Now, there is an initial combination therapy and analysis of cardiovascular outcome has shown that when you combine a GLP-1 with an SGLT-2 inhibitor and a pyoglitazone, it exerts a greater effect to prevent MACE compared with pre-existing diabetes. So you can piggyback a GLP-1 on a SGLT2 and a pyoglitazone and get wonderful results. Weight reduction with GLP1, SGLT2 causes about three, two to three kg weight loss. This is again our paper and uh, three kg weight loss. Liraglutide, over a period of three years, what is the weight loss? 2.3 kg. Now, there are certain absolute indications where GLP can't be used. Only insulin has to be used. Type 1 diabetes, pediatric, pregnancy, severe hyperglycemia, symptomatic hyperglycemia, HbA1c over 10. You have to use insulin. Patients with comorbid conditions, cirrhosis, patients undergoing dialysis, post-transplant, cystic fibrosis. You know, these are daily things which we see in practice where you can't use the GLP-1. Now, what has been the experience with GLP-1 over the years in different countries? In fact, they find that by six months, almost 50% of the patients discontinue the GLP-1, discontinue. Why? This is reasons for discontinuation. And this is done in 10,000 patients across Europe and US. And what did they find? Now, this is the physicians frequently reported, most frequently reported by physicians. Lack of glucose control, 45%. Nausea, vomiting, GI side effects. Are, what are we talking? We are using this to control the diabetes. Look at this. This is the frequently reported by the patient. What does it say? Made me feel sick. Are you treating a patient or you're making him sick? Made me throw up 45%. I would prefer oral injection, 39%. Inadequate glucose control, 34%.
So basically, synopsis of that study was lack of glucose control followed by GI symptoms was the most important reason for discontinuation. As far as the physicians were concerned, as far as the patient was concerned, it made him feel sick. You already have a diabetic poor fellow who is depressed with his disease and you're giving him a medication which costs a bomb and you make him feel sick and you make him vomit and you make him nauseous and what's the big deal? And additionally, depending on the healthcare system, differences in cost in favor of insulin. It favors insulin. In India, the cost is prohibitive. Liraglutide for one year will cost 180,000 rupees. It is mind boggling. Now, look at the patient reporting problems as very or extremely bothersome. Injection too costly, 53%. Now, this is from Europe and US, where the healthcare system is providing them the insulin. And all that they have to pay is a copay. They don't have to pay for the, just a copay. And they find that copay is too expensive. What will happen in our country where we have to pay out of pocket? Impossible. What is the next? Inadequate blood glucose control. Injection itna lagaya, itna paisa kharcha kiya, sugary control nahi. What's the big deal? Made me throw up and vomiting, nausea. But most important, look at this last one. In 50%, it caused weight gain. So when you talk of weight loss, it is not universal. 50% of the patients here had weight gain. So here, to conclude, see, basically when you're treating a diabetic, my basic principle is the patient should not say I'm suffering from diabetes. He should say I'm living with diabetes. That is what life is all about. Here you're going to give him a massively expensive drug, which is going to make him feel sick, make him feel miserable. And with some cardiovascular benefit, which is yes, documented. I fully agree with Mangesh. But we have other drugs which can give you much better cardiovascular outcomes. And insulin is and will be the first injectable of choice. Thank you. Excellent, Dr. Anika, sir. Excellent. Now, after uh, Dr. Divaskar, sir, having all the data to support DLP1 receptor agonists, Dr. Panikar say, uh, sir, coming out with all the real world data, I would say, all the real world patient experiences and all those things. And that actually sets the tone and that tells us that GLP-1 receptor agonists are beautiful molecules on paper. But practically, when we go and everyone in the house will agree to it, when we think practically about India and our practice, we find it little uh, bit icy and constrained ourselves. We find ourselves constrained to write it freely because we are having not that much benefit as compared to the cost. So value for money in, in terms of value for money and the efficacy, uh, they are lacking. So in India, definitely, Dr. Panikar, sir, you've won here and uh, insulin will remain the uh, the first choice, I would say. Uh, a house may differ on it and I will, I will like views of others. Dr. Manoria, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Trivaskar can have a rebuttal. rebuttal. Well, I mean, no question. No question of rebuttal, sir. Honestly speaking, let's come out with the consensus, which, which I completely agree to Dr. Panikar, sir. And this is the ground right. reality. See, Audi can be driven only by Panikar, sir. But I am a driver of a Mars Maruti, you know, simple as that. So, you know, so not all can afford. And let's have a ground reality and a fact which is established over the years that when nothing works, the only drug to come to your rescue is insulin. So, and that is the reason why, you know, GLP-1s have not become popular. And as sir has really pointed out beautifully well, as far as my practice is concerned, and I'm more than sure about Panikarsa's practice is concerned, we have hardly patients which we can count on fingers, those who are on with, in spite of the suggestions and all that. And as Panikar sir has genuinely suggested that we do have got better oral drugs, more safer drugs, more cost-effective drugs to treat the same problems more effectively and probably in a better way in comparison to the GLP-1 receptor. Maybe that they are, these are beautiful drugs. They are in certain amount, certain population, but the garden variety of the patients are almost, you know, which what we see every day in day-to-day -day life. So let's, let's accept to the fact that insulin is the choice. It is the best possible choice whenever it comes to the choosing between 
you know any other injectables which are available for children funny girls sir thank you mangesh i think you have really summed it up very well but let me tell you glp1 is a good drug yes they do have. and especially okay. oral semaglutide coming may have some probably you know say afford patients yes. who can tolerate and who can afford and when the oral uh, glp1 comes semaglutide yes. thing may change and maybe in the next debate i would speak for glp1 <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mangesh. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you, you. Manoj. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Now we move on to the next session, and the speaker for next session is Dr. Raman Puri. He's a senior interventional cardiologist at the Indraprastha Apollo Hospital, New Delhi. Founder and chairman of Lipid Association of India, formerly head department of cardiology at the Saptajang Hospital, and member international lipid expert panel. I'll hand over the session to Dr. Rajiv Agrawal and Dr. Engel to conduct it. Uh, good morning, everybody. I take this opportunity to invite Dr. Anger to initiate the proceedings and invite Dr. Raman Puri for the meeting. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to be part of this meeting. And we have an important topic to be discussed by Dr. Raman Puri. We know that atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is uh, an epidemic proportion in our country. And there are a number of modifiable risk factors, and one of them being the dyslipidemia. And there, our target is LDL cholesterol. So, Dr. Raman Puri is going to tell us what are the messages for a physician dealing with this problem. Dr. Raman Puri is a well known intervention cardiologist. He has passion for both intervention and prevention. Dr. Raman Puri. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh... Good morning. Uh, first of all, I'll thank Dr. P.C. Manoria for giving me an opportunity to speak on management of dyslipidemia in Indians. Uh, this is uh, our recommendation, earlier recommendation, which has been recently published in um, JAPI uh, in month of uh, November. There are a number of articles, but I'll be, uh, you know, uh, talking about LDL cholesterol target in secondary prevention of uh, ASCVD. Uh, these are, uh, we all know that LDL, there is a causal relationship between LDL cholesterol and uh, coronary artery disease. And uh, in 1988, uh, uh, ATP uh, first recommended LDL cholesterol target of less than 130 milligram in patients with high risk group. And this target came down to less than 70 uh, milligram in uh, ATP 3 2004 update. And uh, in 2013, ACC identified four statin groups and they said that there is no need for LDL cholesterol. But based upon these ATP guidelines, we can see that there is a significant reduction in CVD modality in, 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 in United States. Not only total CVD, even CHD came down. But if you look into the CVD mortality statistics in India, it has gone up by 40%. Despite we all have been following Americans and European guidelines, there are a number of reasons for it. One, one of that is that we have a high prevalence of atherogenic dyslipidemia, high visceral adiposity, high incidence of metabolic syndrome. But whatever the reasons may be, uh, this means following this target was not sufficient. So LAI came out with its first expert consensus statement uh, uh, to deal with this uh, problem of increased uh, CAD morbidity and mortality. And uh, uh, they classified patients into four risk group and coronary artery disease and uh, peripheral artery disease and cerebrovascular disease were included in patients in very high risk group. The LDL cholesterol was the primary target and uh, non-SDL cholesterol was a co-primary target uh, as important as primary target and LDL cholesterol goal um, recommended for patients of coronary artery disease or ASCVD was less than 50 milligram. LAI was the first uh, association in the world to recommend uh, very aggressive lowering of LDL cholesterol in, in patients with established ASCVD. This was based upon a strong scientific uh, evidence. Uh, this you can see there are a number of statin trials, PCS and trials, imaging trials, angiography trials, and meta analysis. In uh, 2018, um, ODC outcome trial results were also published at 48 weeks when LDL was cholesterol was reduced from 103 to 53. There was 15% reduction in primary endpoint, which was with the CP value, which was significant. So it also endorsed what we recommended in um, 2016. 
So this is our recommendation of less than 50 milligram in, uh, of LDL in March 2016. In August 2016, European guidelines were published and they still recommended LDL cholesterol of less than 70 milligram in patients with documented coronary artery disease, either diagnosed clinically or by imaging technique. Now, if you look into the improved IT trial, 32.7% of these patients, despite achieving LDL cholesterol of 53, had significant residual risk at uh, seven years. And if you look into the ODC outcome trial, 12.5% of these patients, despite having LDL cholesterol, achieved LDL cholesterol of 53, had events at four years. So what are these group of subgroup of patients who have events even with LDL cholesterol, achieved LDL cholesterol of 53? And what are the baseline characteristics which makes them to have more events at uh, low level of LDL cholesterol of 53? So this is, these are the two important, and second important question which comes in um, mind of every treating physician is that if I lower LDL cholesterol down from 50 to 30 milligram, will I be able to reduce the cardiovascular event or not? So with these two uh, questions in mind, we conducted 19 meetings at 13 cities involving 162 experts, 11 months, and published two important documents. The first document was published in and in March 2020 in, in Journal of Clinical Hepatology, and second, of course, was published recently in November 2020 in JAPI. We, in, uh, we updated our risk uh, stratification algorithm and we created a new risk category, which is an extreme risk group, which was further divided into category A and category B. Category A is those patients of coronary artery disease with one or more features of high risk group, and category B is those patients of coronary artery disease with one or more features of very high risk group. And we added four uh, new uh, moderate non-conventional risk factor in place of metabolic syndrome. LDL cholesterol still remained the uh, primary target and non hdl cholesterol as co-primary target, but the goal was different in extreme risk group. In extreme risk group, category A, the goal was uh, less than 50 milligram, but optional goal was less than or equal to 30 milligram. In category B, it was less than or equal to 30 milligram. Now, question is this, why uh, there was a need to have another risk uh, category, extreme risk group, and, uh, and again, not only extreme risk group, why category A and category B? To understand this, it's important to understand that there are nine independent clinical indicator of atherothrombotic risk. If they are present in patients with coronary artery disease, they increase uh, cardiovascular event. Now, if I apply these uh, TMD score for scanty prevention uh, or these clinical indicator in uh, TRA second prevention TMI 50 trial, we can see that if none of these risk indicator are present in patients with previous myocardial infarction, the three years MACE was only 3.5% and it went up to 58% if more than seven of these risk indicators are present. Now, if I apply it in improved IT trial, uh, what we can see, we can classify these patients into three risk group, high risk group, intermediate risk group, and low risk group. If it is more than three, it is high risk group. If it is two, intermediate. And if it is only patients of coronary artery disease with or without uh, you know, uh, clinical indicator, it falls into low risk group. This red line indicates uh, CV events at 53 milligram of LDL cholesterol and blue line shows CV events at 69 milligram of LDL cholesterol. If we look into the low risk group at 53 milligram of LDL cholesterol, only 14% of patients had cardiovascular event, went up to 19.3 in intermediate risk group and 34% in, in high risk group. And if you look into the benefit in the reduction of cardiovascular event, it was greatest in patients with the uh, high risk group and with an NT of uh, 16, it means you treat, uh, you prevent six event if you treat 100 patients. In, uh, in uh, intermediate risk group, absolute risk reduction was less than uh, high risk group, it was 2.2%. With an NT of 46, you prevent uh, two vascular event if you treat 100 patients and in low risk group, the absolute risk reduction was less than one. It was 0.9% with an NT of uh, 111. So as uh, you know, we as you know that coronary artery disease falls into a risk group of a very high risk group as per our you know recommendation in 2016. So if if they have 14% event at seven years, then and it jumps to 34% uh, in uh, in patients with high risk group. So you cannot have the same goal in patients with coronary artery disease 
which falls into low risk group versus high risk group which uh, have almost uh, 34% event so LAI expert that felt that this group of patients should be extreme risk group category B and here if we reduce LDL cholesterol from down from 50 to 30 milligram there will be definite uh, uh, reduction in cardiovascular event and intermediate risk group was considered as ext extreme risk group category A with an optional goal of uh, 30 milligram in um, uh, of uh, uh, LDL cholesterol. Now, if you look into uh, uh, Odyssey outcome trial and compare uh, disease in three vascular bed uh, versus two vascular bed, we can see that in three vascular bed at achieved LDL cholesterol of 53, 26% of these patients had events. And in, in two vascular bed, 20% uh, of these patients had event at 53 uh, milligram of LDL cholesterol. And in patients with coronary artery disease, only 8.6% patient had cardiovascular event at LDL cholesterol 53. So at 53 milligram of LDL cholesterol, those patients who have three vascular bed almost have three times more events as compared to patients with coronary artery disease. And uh, with two vascular bed, it's, it's about two times more as compared to patients with coronary artery disease. If you look into the NNT, NNT was least eight in patients with uh, three vascular bed, and there was a, a, almost 13% absolute risk reduction. You can see that how widely these two lines are separated. And the, this benefit was very less when it came down to patients with coronary artery disease. So if these patients of uh, coronary artery disease are in group of very high risk group, then three vascular bed group patients falls into an extreme risk group category B, and the, the two vascular bed uh, patients falls into an extreme group category A. So uh, uh, we have now strong evidence that there are uh, there was an additional need for additional um, uh, ASCVD risk group uh, uh, and uh, uh, category A and B because all patients of coronary artery disease cannot be placed in one group and there cannot be a same goal of 50 milligram in patients of coronary artery disease in in all these groups. Now coming to the justification of LDL less than 30 milligram. This again has a very strong scientific evidence. First, more, most important is uh, uh, Fourier trial results here in which we can see that when LDL cholesterol was reduced from 50, 93 to median of 30 milligram, there was 15% reduction in primary endpoint and about 20% reduction in scanty endpoint. Even uh, meta-analysis of statin trial, non-statin trials, and Fourier trials, uh, uh, post-hoc analysis and post-hoc analysis of improved IT trial, and uh, uh, post-hoc analysis of Odyssey outcome trial, all these trials shows that there is uh, uh, lowering LDL cholesterol down to less than 30 milligram from 70 milligram uh, shows a significant reduction in cardiovascular event. If you look into the all-cause death according to achieved LDL cholesterol in Odyssey outcome trial, you can see that there is a minimum mortality when the LDL cholesterol achieved was 30 milligram. Below that, uh, the, the confidential limit was quite wide and it was diffi difficult to interpret it, that how much is the benefit. So we can see that 30 here, again, 30 number is becomes important if you look into the all-cause mortality. If you look into the patients with double loss of function uh, PCSK9 mutations, you can see that most of these patients have LDL less than 20 milligram. And despite having uh, LDL less than 20 milligram, these subjects are absolutely healthy, fertile, and have a normal cognitive functions. Now, if you look into the <coughs> imaging trial in um, in pravastatin trial, reversal trial, uh, with the mean LDL cholesterol achieved of 110, there was 2.7% increase in total ethroma volume, and it came down to 0.4% when LDL was reduced to 79 milligram with 80 milligram of atorvastatin. In GLAFGO trial, you can see that from 93 to 30 milligram, there was a significant 0.95% reduction in percent ethroma volume. So as far as safety margins are concerned, we all know that statin is a safe drug. We have experience of almost three decades and so is uh, azetamide. And now the, we have five years, uh, you know, long-term trial results of Osler one study, which shows that there is a persistent 56% uh, lowering of LDL cholesterol without any significant adverse effect. Uh, this is recently, this uh, uh, clinical review has been sent to me by Dr. Rajiv Agarwal uh, day before yesterday. Uh, this is published in uh, um, um, Journal of uh, European Heart Journal. That also shows that how low is safe, the frontier of very low, uh, less than 30 milligram of LDL cholesterol. 
Here, it shows that by reducing LDL cholesterol down to less than 30 milligram, there is a coronary atherosclerotic plaque regression, and there is a statistically significant reduction in this uh, major cardiovascular event. And there are potential adverse effect. You know, they are they are thought of, but none of these uh, you know adverse effect has been seen significantly in the trials which we have the results so far because. In four-year trial, 2% of patients had LDL cholesterol of less than 10 milligram, and 7.5% of patients in Odyssey outcome trial had LDL cholesterol less than 15 milligram, and about 6% uh, of patients in improved IT trial had LDL cholesterol 30 milligram. None of these trials have shown increase in onset of diabetes, a significant increase in hemorrhagic stroke and cataract. Dr. Puri, one minute left. Yes, sir. So I'm going to be, I'll finish it in one minute. This is the treatment algorithm of uh, patients of very high risk group and extreme risk group. And so uh, thus we have strong evidence that if we reduce LDL cholesterol to less than 30 milligram, we can reduce uh, cardiovascular even further from uh, any achieved, any basal LDL cholesterol level. And to conclude, all patients of CAD cannot be grouped in one category. Associated comorbidities increases future CVE demands. Coronary artery disease patients should be regrouped and recategorized as recommended by LAI expert consensus 2020 and achieve respective LDL cholesterol and non-SDL cholesterol target. LDL cholesterol less than 30 milligram is safe and can be achieved by currently available lipid lowering drug. PCSK9 inhibitor to be started if the LDL cholesterol target is not achieved despite maximum lipid lowering drug. Strong emphasis on aggressive lifestyle intervention and control of all modifiable ASFD risk factors. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So is there any question which can, which needs to be answered? And I think Dr. Raman has done a wonderful job and taking us down to as low as 30, a new frontier, which has come from four year. And another thing which I want to make out is that the target is not 30, target is less than 30. So if, if you achieve something like 25, 20, don't get upset, don't down titrate the drug, maintain it. So lipidology, we have targets which are not numbers, which are less than. So even if you say 30, I'll say the guideline recommend less than 30, any value less than that is, is a wonderful achievement. Of course, it is very difficult to achieve in large the number of patients, but those who are hyper responders to uh, lipid lowering therapy do achieve these things. And Indian, by and large, having a low body mass index, we achieve higher, higher. Uh, I mean, more lowering of LDL in such patients. Dr. Ayengar, you want to add on anything? Uh, nothing more. We'll take questions from the audience if there are any. Uh, Dr. Puri, statins have a great legacy effect. Voscop trial takes statin for five years, enjoy the benefit for 25 years. Is there any data coming with PCSK9 inhibitors, particularly because they are so costly? Sir, only we have uh, five years, uh, uh, you know, results uh, from uh, Osler one study. Uh, after that, uh, we, I have not come across any study more than five years of PCSK9 inhibitor so far. If anybody has an experience, we don't know. Only five years we have. Yeah, I think that's right. I can only guess, you know, basically when you treat these patients with PCSK9 inhibitors, you bring down the LDL cholesterol, the plaque gets stabilized. It's likely that even if you stop PCSK9 with the stabilized plaque, and other measures, probably there will be a legacy effect. But as such, there are no... Any uh, so we move on to the next session. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. I'll hand over the mic to...